Dear friends, in chapter four, we have set out a surgical strategy for a detachment that has to be operated by external maneuvers in accordance with the guidelines of the EVRSRD study. You are in the operating room and before seeing how you are going to perform these procedures, let's look at the equipment you will need and how and you and the patient will be set up. You will first need a microscope equipped with a slit lamp. You see me coming. I'm going to advise you to use the slit lamp associated with the Freemior lens for all these external maneuvers. And I hear from here some people saying, oh, it's corny, it's old fashioned. Ducourneau is an old crocodile. For those, I will say this. The introduction of the operating sit lamp is much later than indirect ophthalmoscopy, which may seem much more corny. I can admit that making an indentation could be considered as old-fashioned, even if we know now that not making it is, in the majority of cases, inducing a risk for the patient and that there are even cases where the only way to have a failure is precisely to make a vitrectomy. So why this feeling? Because we have made great progress in vitrectomy over the last 40 years, while indentation technique have not evolved much. This can make the vitrectomy operator feel more up-to-date, supported by an industry that offers increasingly expensive vitrectomy procedures. But frankly, since we know now from the EVRSRD study that you have to know how to make an indentation and this is confirmed by statistically significant results, which are difficult for you to challenge unless you want to deny the usefulness of scientific work or think that 180 surgeons from 48 countries have banded together to fake results. Then, yes, not to use the microscope in the 21st century when it is used for everything, even for strabisms. No, yes, this is corny. Finally, and I would say to those who criticize the use of the slit lamp and the microscope simply because they have not assimilated the technique, and are afraid that it will take too long to operate, that I experienced this too at the beginning of my career with cataract operators who had not yet converted to the advantages of the microscope. But it's not easier to make a suture on a thinned sclera that, than uh, on a cornea. And the control that the microscope allows saves time for cataract as for detachments. I was used to perform each day in a single operating room with seven minutes of cleaning between each patient, between 16 and 24 retina surgeries per day. In the morning, between 9 a.m. and 1 p.m., I did the 13 scheduled patients, mainly membrane and macular holes. And in the afternoon, I did the emergencies seen the day before. For example, two vitreous hemorrhages, one diabetic retinopathy, and five to seven detachments. And on average, out of seven detachments, I would say that I was performing at least four indentations. 
The reason why I could do this activity is because with the microscope it goes much faster. A cryo indentation, drainage and gas injection took me between 10 to 20 minutes depending on whether it was a segmental indentation or a cerclage. Let's take an example. You have made an indentation and you want to control its height and its correct positioning. If you work under the microscope, you place the femoral lens, let's see, and um, yeah, uh, I, I find that the tear is a little bit too posterior, uh, so I better have to move back the indentation a little bit and uh, do a new contour. Let's see, yes. So control, yes. Uh, uh, I think it's good. A drainage and an air bubble and the tear will be well carried out on the indentation. It all took less than 50 seconds to do two controls with the femoral lens and the repositioning of the buckle. If we now work with indirect ophthalmoscopy, let's see what it gives. So I will make a control. Yes, so please remove the table. Uh, give me the helmet, helmet, please. Yes, good. Yeah, give me the lens. Yes, so I have it. Ah, I touch the table. I ask you to remove the table, please. <sighs> Don't let me say things twice. Uh, let's see. Uh, well, let's take the, the wire uh, here. Yeah, okay. It's okay, yes. Now I see, yes, uh, I think that there is a little bit too posterior. I would rather had to have to replace it more posteriorly. Yes, so let's see. Um, can you please take the lens, please? Uh, yes, the helmet. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, Yes, look here. Okay, can you give me glove, please? Yes, eight. You are working with me for five years. You must know the, the size, huh? Okay, give me it. Okay. Yes, please. Can you protect a little bit because I, I'm sure I have touch. Yes. Now, okay, let's see. So, you see, it took two to three minutes to do only one check. So you're going to tell me, Didier, surgery is not a race. And that's true. But, sincerely, in practice, what is going to happen? Well, the second checkup, you won't do it because you've already spent energy on the tail location and then on the cryo, and it's your fifth detachment and you're exhausted. And you say, well, this time, I think it's going to be okay. Loss of chance for the patient and extreme fatigue for you. And I think this is partly responsible for this disaffection for indentation, 
which requires too much effort in the correspondence between the internal and the external viewing, added to the fact that it's no longer widely taught. On the other hand, I can assure you that if you assimilate this technique combining the microscope and the slit lamp, not only will you save eyes of many patients, but you will also save time. I don't know anyone working in indirect ophthalmoscopy and performing as many retina surgeries as I did in one day. But all those who adopted the microscope slit lamp combination at a speed comparable to mine. And frankly, since you have used the advantages of the biomicroscope for your pre-operative examination, and you have taken some landmarks with it, why not continue and find the same landmarks and the same sensations with a microscope equipped with a slit lamp? You therefore need a microscope equipped with a slit lamp. You can choose between two kinds of lamp, external lamp or integrated lamp. I've been working for 30 years with the Zeiss external lamp, but I've also tried the slit lamp of the Lake F F40, which is great, even brighter than the Zeiss one. There are two advantages for the external lamp. The first is that it is mobile. This is not a fundamental advantage in retina surgery because a fixed angulation between 5 and 7 degrees from the axis is a compromise which corresponds to 98% of the cases. Certainly some meiosis can benefit from an even smaller angle to the axis, provided that uh, the highest magnification is used. But normally between five and seven degrees is good. You can review how to play this lit lamp correctly in chapter five of the, on the playlist on the macula. The second advantage of the external lamp is for the anterior segment operators who will be able to combine it with the coaxial light. When both light are switched on at the same time and the slit is placed much more to the side, there is no need for trap and blue to make the rexis or of a white or black cataract and it gives better appreciation of the depth of a sclerotomy or a groove during a FECO. On the other hand, the disadvantage of the external lamp is its bulk. It sometimes touches the sterile sheet covering a fat patient and in practice it is often removed by the non-retinologist which is a source of wear and tear and disruption. This is why the lamps integrated in the body of the microscope were designed. There are two of them, the Zeiss lamp and the top cone lamp called Office, which is not good because it is placed frontally. Why do we choose a vertical slip during a biomicroscope examination? It is so that the angle between the slit and your eye is not the same for your left and your right eye in order to give this notion of relief. If the slit is horizontal, the angle will be practically the same. This notion of relief in the optical section is fundamental and explains the craze for 3D systems which uh, with uh, adapted glasses, but this craze does not exist for operators using the slit lamp. However, the disadvantage of the Zeiss integrated lamp is that it is not compatible with coaxial lighting. One has to choose between the two. But whether it is an external or, or integrated slit lamp, one of the characteristics 
characteristics of the operating lamp is that, unlike other illumination systems, it follows by definition the axis of the microscope. It is therefore to the patient's eye to adapt to the axis of the microscope. If the body of the microscope is perfectly vertical, then the patient's eyes will have to look vertical if you want the light to illuminate the fundus. The patient's heads should be positioned so that the iris plane is perfectly horizontal. Before starting the operation, you will have to check the position of the patient's head. If the positioning is not correct, as here. Take time to lower the headrest. Be careful to choose a thin headrest so that you can move your legs freely under the headrest of the operating table if it is lowered. Make sure that the patient's head extends slightly beyond the headrest. If the head is placed further back, then the risk for the surgeon is to bend forward and perform a cervical lordosis, the harmful effects of which will be seen, and this brings us to the subject of the surgeon's installation. It is the patient's interest that you should be comfortable, because it will make you perform better during the entire surgery session, but also during your entire active life. If I'm telling you this, it's because we do a risky job for the cervical spin. Very many retinologists, retinosurgeon, have had problems, and myself, I did during a surgical session in 1986, a C6 effort fracture with tearing of the incus and cervicobrachial neuralgia. For my personal surgical longevity, I therefore plunged into this problem and analyzed the reason why I was hurt. You have two essential areas to consider. The first is the space available for your legs, which will condition the second space between the first and your eyes. So you understand right away that in order not to have installation problem, it's better to have a small shins to pass easily under the table that you will even be able to lower. Alas, I had and still have long shins. At the time, I operated with a table that had a system at the front to position the patient's heads, but which on the other hand, did not allow the surgeon's legs to move freely. It also had a base that prevented the pedals from being placed in front of the surgeon. They had to be placed on either side of the base. Working with my legs spread apart was my first serious mistake because it leads to a position of the pelvis displacing the entire vertebral stature. This is why, after my accident and six months of wearing a neck brace from the skull to the pelvis, I calculated that we need about 55 centimeters of free space in front of the table base to place the pedal. The, DE, the ideal is to have the pedal at the same height, so that your feet are also at the same height to maintain good lumbar stability. I had also had the height of my striker's height rest reduced. The normal one is very comfortable for the patient, but raises the head and thus reduces the distance between patient's eyes and yours. This distance combines fixed aids such as the body of the microscope and its focal length with variable aids such as the inclination of the eyepieces a laser filter or an image inverter. If you add all that up, 
you should better have a long burst. But alas, I had a small burst. Mireille Bonnet has had a laser added into the body of the microscope, which also increases his height and has caused her a cervical problem. I had Zeiss built an image inverter to work with the, the heavy Gimblatt's wide field lens. And in order to cope with the excessive height of the microscope, I put the eyepiece horizontally. And that was my second mistake. Why? Because the risk is to create an antiphysiological cervical lordosis, which, in case of contractions, can create a bone fracture. This is a very dangerous position, whereas this, like a reading position, is very safe for your spine. So, pay attention to your operating table and avoid anything that would add aid to your microscope. Finally, you have to relax next muscle. You must have low shoulders. So, don't use armrest, which would inevitably cause your shoulder to rise and contract. The elbows must be free and hanging down. Finally, if you have to work more temporarily or more nasally to avoid a sclerectomy or because the patient's nose is big, turn around the patient to keep the same relaxed position. Don't lift a shoulder to avoid the risk of contracture. So, well, what else can I tell you about specific equipment? The free mirror lens. Choose a small free mirror lens. When I say small, I don't mean, mean a child's lens that has a tighter radius of curvature to suit children's cornea. I mean an adult lens, but not so high. In fact, as it is less high, it is therefore less wide and does not hinder the passage of the cryoprobe vertically. In at least 95% of the cases, I used only the equatorial mirror to examine the entire periphery. I used the peripheral mirror, the one between the equatorial and the mirror for the angle, only for dialysis at the hora serrata. Personally, I use the disposable lens from FCI, which are worth 25 euros each, which, given the lack of need of for maintenance and sterilization, is very acceptable. What else? Uh, the cryo. The cryo probe is not a problem-free instrument because it's quite easily clogged. At the clinic, given the activity in the operating room, we had invested in 12 to 14 re-sterilizable cryoprobes because we knew that there would always be two under repair. The repair were expensive, but given the number, it was cost effective. However, problem can arise for departments with uh, less activity because if you have only four probes, you cannot have two under repair. In these cases, it is worthwhile to get the FACOS disposable cryoprobes, which are 100 euros each, but do not require, require a large stock. I will finish with uh, some specific instruments. I had short strabism hooks so that they cannot touch the microscope during maneuvers. To locate tears, I preferred the meyer schwickerath marker, which ends with a ball and a small, not too aggressive tip, uh, 
who has, which has, was much less aggressive than the triangular tip of the Uretzavalia marker. Finally, my operating assistant also used the bone retractor to recline the tissue outside. And since we are talking about the operating assistant, I would like to end this chapter with a few tips to help you become more familiar with the user's slit lamp at the Freemier lens in all uh, those external maneuvers where the role of the operating assistant is fundamental. Perform a conjunctival incision one to two millimeters from the limbus for several reasons. Firstly, because it bleeds less than at the limbus. Because at the end of the operation, it allows you to suture edge to edge with the diatemi forceps if you control its power with a foot pedal. And this reduces the inflammatory reaction linked to the sutures. But also because the small collar of conjunctiva that you leave will prevent blood from infiltrating under the lens placed on the cornea. The conjunctival opening must be performed in all quadrants requiring either an indentation or a cryo check. We are not in a macular surgery where we are trying to respect the conjunctival integrity. It's better to make a two quadrants incision instead of just one if there is any doubt about the existence of a tear so as not to be forced to return to it because of an oversight. The tenon will be open a little further back with the Severin, Severin scissors to avoid bleeding. Take the opportunity to look at the sclera, simply to check that there is not sclerosmalacia that could change the whole strategy. A 2-0 wire is passed under each muscle surrounding the areas to be explored. And here, the assistant will play a crucial role. He has to pull up the two wires surrounding the quadrant where you are walking. This will have two effects. First, the eye will be clear of the conjunctival plane, but also it will tilt slightly in the direction opposed to the areas you are walking in. The pupillary plane will therefore open up a little bit and allow the slit light to enter more widely. But in addition to pulling upwards, the assistant will act on these two zero wires in a revolving manner so that the zone where you are walking is always in the six o'clock noon axis, the axis of the slit light. You all know that a 6-9 o'clock axis is the most difficult place to examine the periphery with a biomicroscope and the easiest place to let a tear go through. Therefore, the entire superior retina and its corresponding sclera will be explored at noon and its inferior counterpart at 6 o'clock. The equatorial mirror will therefore be placed at 6 o'clock to examine the entire superior retina and at noon to examine the entire lower retina. In order to facilitate the slit light to illuminate the superior retina periphery, I also use to slightly tilt the axis of the microscope body toward the patient's feet and conversely toward the top of the patient's skull to examine the lower retina. Thus, the equatorial mirror of the Goldman lens is illuminated in a less tangential way, the pupil being well-oriented thanks to the tilting of the eye, all the conditions are gathered to allow an optimal examination. The fluidity, 
reliability and speed of the entire surgical procedure depend on this collaboration between the operator and the surgical assistant. Unlike a cataract, the use of an inexperienced assistant can easily double your operating time. In the next chapter, we will look more in detail at the why and how of the assistant gestures when we talk about your gestures, since both must work simultaneously. So see you soon to talk about performing these external maneuvers.